Good morning. Now you may have seen reviews of this bike before, usually ridden by kids performing fantastic jumps or descending outrageously dangerous and impossibly rocky slopes at huge speeds. And that's nice. But frankly, you and I want a bike that can take you anywhere, and I mean anywhere, but at your pace. You still want to tear up the trails to the best of your ability, of course, but maybe with a little help. Is the Rise the right bike for you, as well as those crazy kids? Simply, yes. Now I know this is the 2023 Orbea Rise and a lot of people have been waiting a long time for this model to come out, the updated model. Um, a lot of that sort of goes over my head because I didn't really know about them in the first place. So really I'd prefer to talk about how this bike seems and how it feels and how it makes me feel rather than talk about an OC Mountain Control MC20 31.6mm dropper post offering 150 millimeters of travel. Now that is really nice, but you know, I don't think it's that important, not least because you can specify the specification of your bike as optional extras or just by choosing the model. So I'm more likely to just drop in a clip from the first time I used the dropper post in anger. That dropper post is cool. So if I'm going to talk about how it makes me feel first, well, that's easy. It makes me feel younger. The assist, as I've said, means that you can make believe that you are fitter, stronger and faster than maybe you are. Maybe. Well, just a little bit. In fact, the way I've been describing this bike on these last few vids, between lots of giggling and how good is this? Oh, come on! And this is amazing! It's pretty similar to how Orbea are describing it. I've been saying over and over that it feels like you've got superpowers. It doesn't feel like the bike is shoving you up the hill, but that somehow you're doing it on your own. The interface between your effort and the rise is seamless. So, but Orbea say, supercharge you. Well, it's near enough. I actually prefer my superpowery thing, but there you go. So first things first, range. Now buyers of e-bikes are obsessed with range. That's until they buy an e-bike and then they realize how it's completely individual and it's made of, for example, the level of cyst you're in, how fit you are, how much you weigh, how much climbing you do, how steep those climbs are, and even what time of year you're riding. It's better to say that once you have bought your e-bike, you will adapt to it and it to you and you'll be happy. And if you're not happy, you'll buy a range extender. Now that said, this bike does go about things in a slightly different way. It's lighter than its rivals. The very lightest carbon model is 15.9 kilos. This top of the range aluminium H10 is around 19 kilos. Now those weights aren't bad, just for full suspension mountain bikes, but these are electrical too. So Orbea have worked long and hard with Shimano who make the motor and this is the new EP801 in here. Um, they've modified and customised the motor's output. The overall torque is down from 85 newton metres to 60 newton metres. Now this is the grunt that drags you up steep hills and accelerates you from stopped. So why have they done this? Because it gives extra range. Now as older, wiser and probably less spotty individuals, this is a good thing for us. Those kids we talked about at the beginning, well, they want to go downhill really fast. They have less interest in the getting to the top of the hill or exploring or having adventures. They want to get up to get down. They want the bike to get them to the top of the descent as easily and as fast as possible. The reality is they probably haven't even bought the rise, but it's chunky, high power, big brother, the wild. And the wild looks like a true beast. I'd love to try it, but I'm pretty sure I'd prefer the rise because for me, I like cycling. For me, cycling is pedalling under my own power as much as possible. Now, the rise that I was sent came with a new 540 watt hour battery, which is a big increase on the model standard, which was 320 watt hour, something like that. Now, so far, the largest amount of climbing I've done is 622 meters. Oh, forget about range as being distance. 
it's not difficult to actually ride this bike above the cutoff speed, which here in Europe is 25 kilometers an hour. So in terms of miles or kilometers, it's ranges until you get tired. Now those 622 meters were very steep. I had the motor on the middle or high settings the whole time. And when I checked the app, I'd used two bars. So I had somewhere between 40 and 60% of my battery left. Now you'll notice I said I looked at the app. This is a little gripe that I have that I'm now going to explain separately. So in keeping with its more bike, less E philosophy, the Rise originally had a, um, a toggle button here for um, going up and down the assist levels. And to tell how your battery was doing, um, there was a weird little sort of junction box here with two little LEDs on it, one for assist level and one for uh, battery level. It wasn't well liked, it looked like a bodge. So what they've done is that they've introduced this new um, indicator and toggle switch on the handlebars and it's pretty nifty because it also turns the entire system on and off from this button here. And there it is. So it's got a battery status indicator and it's got an assist level indicator, which is just up and down from bluey white to green to amber and then back down again to off. Now, that's great, fantastic. It works really nicely. I love that it's so minimalist, but there's a problem with it. And the problem is the battery indicator stays green until you've only got 20% left of your battery, at which point it goes red. And then at 10%, it flashes red and puts you in limp home mode. That's not enough indication. It should be at least every 20% or 25%, so four or five sections, so that you know how much battery you've got left, so you can plan your ride. You don't want to be left halfway around a course, um, finding that you've still got more than half of your climbing left to do, and for the light to go red, because that means you'll be pushing the bike or you'll be riding it yourself without any assist by the time you get to the end. Now, you can use the app. The app will let you know in five bands um, what the battery state is, but you don't necessarily want to look at your phone. You don't necessarily want the phone to be on your handlebars um, because the other thing you can do with this bike is connect it to a Garmin and then the Garmin could have uh, fields which actually tell you the exact battery charge left. And that's great, but not everyone wants that. And of course it doesn't come with the bike. So this is what you've got. It's a really neat system. Um, but it has that flaw. And I don't know why, because that's exactly the same as the little junction box indicator that everyone hated. That also went from 100 down to 20% as its main two battery indicator levels. Now, I'm also a little bit confused because in the only manual I could find on this, um, on this switch, it actually has it um, with much more sensible uh, levels of battery charge. Um, but in the one that I've actually got in front of me, no, it's 100 down to 20, all is green. Next, we're going to talk about the power. So, Bayer have downgraded the power for this motor so it can give greater range. Now, how does that feel on the trails? Well, if you're coming from a low-powered road bike like me, the power feels mighty. But if you're coming from a city hybrid e-bike, that you can ghost pedal and still reach the cutoff speed of 25 kilometers an hour, it may feel a little underwhelming. Whereas if you're coming from an analog muscle bike, you know, a typical mountain bike, so you're someone who's used to pedaling, and if you have the setting to max, you're gonna feel superhuman. Now you can, of course, and will turn the power down. The other thing I've mentioned before on my videos is that there are torque and cadence sensors in this thing. Now it's why you think the power comes all from you and why it makes the bike feel so beautifully natural. So it's worth remembering that the power is there, but you do have to work for it. Your cadence needs to be between 75 and 90 to get the most from the assist. And how hard you pedal, well it's difficult to quantify. And it does seem to be variable, so it's something for you to discover. But please don't concern yourself. It will feel very natural and it will be enough. 
Next, we're going to talk about comfort. Now, I've never ridden a full suspension bike before, so these are pretty more generic observations. The suspension is superb. It can be infinitely adjusted to suit your preferences, the terrain and your weight. On this H10, the front forks are upgraded to provide greater travel and to be more robust. And the tyres, to me, seem absolutely enormous. I'm a roadie, so 60mm tyres, which these are roughly, just seem vast. They're also tubeless, and I'm running them at £35 per square inch, which is appropriate for my weight and for the terrain. And they remove yet more vibration, but also add huge amounts of grip on loose surfaces. They add to the feeling of reassurance as well as comfort. Now over the rough rutted tracks that I've been riding, you feel almost nothing, but in a good way. And when things get even rougher, and you're stood up on the pedals with your arms and legs bent, you've got even more shock absorption, and you still feel almost nothing. The wheels drop down into the holes, and the suspension compresses as you hit a rock. It's absolutely amazing. Now all this added to a huge plus for me personally. I suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome. My uh, fingers go numb after about 15 minutes of um, riding. I've had three operations on it so far and I've not suffered from it once since riding the rise and my longest ride is 2 hours 40 minutes. Now you can't tell me that's not down to the suspension and the tyres. Now move quickly on to the saddle. Most people will replace the saddle with something they've already found that they prefer. Now I didn't really have that option because this is a lone bike but the stock Physic Taiga saddle is only 137 millimeters wide. Now, officially, I need a 155 millimeter saddle. Yet this saddle is more comfortable than my correct one on my road bike. I suspect it's a combination of the upright riding position, the amount of time I'm spending descending out of the saddle, and the adrenaline rush that riding this bike gives you overall, that together mean I'm spending an awful lot less, less time thinking about my ass. Now I've lumped the next few things under the, the title safety. Now again, this is more of a generic item for these sorts of bikes. But if you haven't tried big hydraulic disc brakes yet, you're gonna be amazed. Now I love them on my road bike, and I was a big rim brake fan before, but with the more rapidly changing nature of off-road downhill riding, with tracks winding around trees or suddenly dipping, you need to be able to slow yourself quickly and safely. Now these brakes stop me and my mass, when I'm hurtling downhill fantastically well, they'll be even better for most of you. Now the long, low geometry added to the tyres that I've already mentioned work to make the handling on rough surfaces feel really assured. Um, after one ride, I felt confident enough to start giving the bike its head, i.e. letting go of the brakes, and it tracks sure-footedly over surfaces your brain is telling you will throw you off and yet you don't fall. Okay, I have, but that was my own silly fault. But as your confidence grows and you feel more secure, it's just, it's a lovely feeling. And finally, the handlebars. They've made them even wider this year, so they're now 800 millimeters wide. Now, it feels odd to me as a, a road biker, but what it means is that you've got these huge long levers, and if you hit a rock, and the wheel tries to knock itself sideways, you're hanging on to these huge long levers to stop it from doing it. I know that previously there have been some complaints about the charge port on the rise. Well, that's something they fixed. It was almost impossible to get open and shut before. Simple. It's got this little catch on underneath. Very basic. Works. And if you're wondering what the other controls are here, of course, it's just the, the brakes, which you can use just with one finger, and you've got the dropper post switch here. What happens is, whoop, up it goes. Nice and convenient. And only on the other side, obviously it's absolutely okay. standard, you've got uh, the gear changing toggles. Nice and easy, just with a thumb, and one finger on the brakes. This H10 rise came with a 51 to 10 rear cassette, 12 speed, 
and up front is a 32 tooth chain ring but I've not actually used either first or second gear yet. So there it is, it's the Orbea Rise H10 2023. It's a hell of a bike. I love it. In fact, you'll probably notice it's moved. I've been out for another ride on it. It's just too good to ignore. It's just thrilling. It's a, wow, it's a great bike.